Diane Fossey gained international fame, saving the last of the mountain gorillas. The death of naturalist Diane Fossey. She was found dead in the central African state of Rwanda. Fossey was found in her cabin in the African rainforest, brutally murdered, hacked to death. I came here essentially for research. I wanted to know all there was to be known about them. Diane knows their personalities, their habits, and is learning how they communicate. Many who knew her saw a darker side and felt she had become obsessed with saving the gorillas. It was something I just felt compelled to do. I had to do it. I can't explain it. Even if the police do solve her murder, another mystery will remain. The mystery of her life. dreamed of perhaps going to Africa someday. I definitely wanted to see scenery. I wanted to see trees. I wanted the excitement. I think you're going to find this discussion fascinating. Anybody who wanted to study mountain gorillas, Diane Fossey was the person you wanted to contact. She was famous. Would you welcome, please, Diane Fossey. <laughs> what prompted you to go and choose this particular um, area of animals? It was something I just felt compelled to do. I had to do it. I can't explain it very dramatically. It was something I knew there were animals to be learned about, and there weren't very many gorillas left in the world. Yeah. There certainly are very few now. The only place you could go if you wanted to study gorillas was Karasoki Research Center in Rwanda. I was probably about four or five when I first saw the gorillas at the Museum of Natural History in New York City. I felt like the exhibit was alive. And I felt like I was stepping into a world of nature and it just fascinated me. It just overwhelmed me with excitement. At that point, I realized that I want to see them someday. And then 30 years later, here I was studying mountain gorillas with Diane Fossey. There was going to be a dream come true. However, my dream come true also became a nightmare. so hard for me to talk about the story because of the emotional pain. When I went into the room, you had tables knocked over, papers everywhere. There was blood behind her head, in her hair, and the gash going across her face, over her nose, onto her cheek. There was hair in her hand. I couldn't believe what I was looking at. I couldn't believe that she's lying there like that. Here's this woman that always portrayed herself as being strong and everything. Totally helpless and totally gone. There are only 200 mountain gorillas left in the world, which is why I fight so hard for them. The man who kills the animals today is the man who kills the people who get in his way tomorrow. 
I saw her body myself. She had been hacked to death with a machete, you know, on, on her face, on her head. Her eyes were open, and I kept thinking she's alive, but she was not. Um, it was really, um, it was very difficult. Her last few moments must have been really awful. She would not have died immediately. I'm sure she experienced a lot of pain. You are Kikrum Mugutia. No, no, did the Fatty Chemez to the Nguruki Chico? Because the clear implication is these are the men who got into her house. I never heard anything about anyone trying to record solid evidence of this trail of footprints. Il n'y a eu aucune espèce de précaution de, de protéger euh, la scène, absolument pas. Elle avait des cheveux euh, dans les mains euh, serrés. Et c'était des cheveux euh, européens. I thought to myself, well, you know, is that her hair? Or is that maybe hair from the person or persons that attacked her? I took hair out of her right and left hand and put them in separate envelopes. And I cut hair off her head and put that in an envelope so it could be sent to the FBI. And the police did see me doing that. A world-renowned naturalist has been discovered murdered at her home in Africa. Friends speculated that Diane Fossey may have been murdered by poachers she had fought for the past 18 years. For the outside world, knowing, having read about Diane's struggle against the poachers, well, it was obvious it was the poachers what did it. But I don't think the evidence stacks up. I think it was much more planned and sophisticated than a thief or a poacher going in. Something didn't feel right. Everything that could possibly be broken was broken. Like someone was in a rage, you know, or someone was looking for something. Drawers were pulled open, things had been pulled out. It looked like somebody was looking for something. Money was not taken. There was a couple of handguns down there. When you don't take the money, when you don't take the gun, when you don't take anything visible, to me, that's automatically exclude poachers being the people. It looks like a setup. It looked like it was done to just make believe that poachers have done that. Whoever came here that night cut a hole through this corrugated iron with a machete like this called a panga, then crawled inside and slashed her to death. Someone cut a small piece three by three feet 
hole in the bedroom. That's going to make noise. So why wouldn't she flee? How did she end up being killed right there by her bed? The official story was whoever did that did it from the outside and got into the house by doing that. But I think it's probably a lot more likely that whoever did it did it from the inside to make it look like that's how they had gotten in. It almost seemed like it was staged. The amazing thing about it was there wasn't a heck of a lot of blood. You know, I, I'm wondering what's going on here. If you got slashed a machete, you should be bleeding all over the place. Was she killed someplace else and brought back into the room? From what I saw, nothing comes together into a coherent story. It may have been a killing that was ordered by someone. La rumeur courait euh, que c'était les autorités rwandaises qui l'avaient fait tuer. When contemplating the vast expanse of uninhabited, rugged, mountainous land surrounding me, I consider myself one of the world's most fortunate people. There are no words to describe the joy and complete satisfaction one feels after sitting in their midst for several hours in mutual trust and confidence. At times, the rapport simply overwhelms me. It is the only place that I belong. High in the hills of Rwanda in Central Africa, Diane Fossey was buried today. She was buried according to her wishes among the animals that never harmed. She was buried eight years to the day since Digit's death. Whatever happened to her, she didn't deserve being brutally killed and stowed away in the ground. It was almost like it was surreal. I will never talk to this woman again. I will never see her alive again. She was a prominent person and she had been murdered in a brutal fashion. The Rwandans obviously were embarrassed that this crime had occurred and probably worried that it was going to bring negative publicity. I was now in a situation where I was in charge of this camp. Soon after the funeral, a day or two later, I got someone knocking on my door. It looked like he might be police or military. And he said, I'm taking these guys down. I hope you understand. They took away several of the most important trackers to uh, be interrogated. It clearly, as far as we could tell, was not staff who killed Diane. If you've had a job for 
nearly 20 years. Do you kill your boss and be out of work? I was asked to go and deal with her belongings and assess the future of the camp. And I went up to Karisoki with the American consul. The embassy had taken possession of the property pending an inventory of her effects. For me, the most significant thing was looking through a letter file. I found a letter, a carbon copy of a letter to me that I'd never received. Dear Ian, the latest poacher captured is also a gold smuggler between Zaire and Rwanda. I examined his clothing to find a letter between him and his dealer, setting up appointment places for gold deliveries. It might have got lost in the post, but it's odd that all the other carbon copies of letters were letters that I'd received, but this one was missing. Gold smuggling, that's serious people, people with money. And if their names are on a piece of paper, that's evidence against them. Reading that with Ian felt very much like we were, that, that we were understanding exactly what had happened there at that moment. There was always smuggling going on through the park. That was a well-known fact. Diane quite often made it known to people that she had information on them, so they better watch their P's and Q's. The, the carbon copy of the letter seemed to me to be important evidence. So I have photocopied it and gave a copy to the authorities. The day after I got back, there was a knock on the embassy door, and the police were there, and they said they would like the hair samples. So I divided them up. So they got half the hair samples, and I kept half the hair samples. We were all suspects. Anybody any outsider, any foreigner that can connect with Karasoki. So we thought it's all kind of absurd, but it's not impossible that something bad could happen. One day I had found a skeleton of a gorilla and I brought the pieces back to camp and put them on a picture table that was near Diane's house. And so I was examining it. I noticed as I looked up, there was somebody in there. I could see them, just kind of a shadow. I got concerned, so my first response, feeling I'm responsible for the camp, was to go over to the window and to look in. And actually, uh, probably wasn't the smartest thing to do, but I went into the cabin. <laughs> And when I did, no sooner did I do that, I turned around, there was a guard coming up. I didn't have boxes. I wasn't stealing anything. The event kind of got out of the hand. I went back to my house. There was a hothead there with a gun, and he started yelling and screaming at me, and he took a rifle like to aim at me. There was nothing for me to gain by going into the house. What did I need? It's a mistake I made. Breaking into the house of the Anforsi stealing some of the Dan's manuscripts or something. If it's true and he did that and we have evidence, then I would be suspicious of Wayne. Next thing you know, I was accused of murder.
I received a letter that I need to go down to the police station uh, for a questioning. The prosecutor came in after everybody else was there. He came in and he would pace back and forth like this and look at me. Why didn't you hear all the noise when she was murdered? I was sleeping sound asleep. I was on the other side of camp. Who would have killed Diane Fossey? Who would have killed Diane Fossey? I said, poachers. And uh, he kept turning around and saying, no, you killed her. You broke in and you stole her precious documents. You killed her for her precious documents. What? You know, I didn't kill her. We were friends. And every once in a while, the guy behind me would push my shoulder like this, pushing me forward. So I've got a prosecutor here, I've got an interpreter over here, and someone behind me. And so I was boxed in. I'm by myself, and I'm trapped. He would make an accusation and push, make an accusation, push. He kept raising his voice, kept raising his voice over and over and over again, louder and louder, and push, push. I kept saying I didn't do it. I didn't do this. He pushed this paper towards me with a pen, signed the paper. I didn't kill anybody. Sign it, sign it. I don't want to sign any paper. I didn't do anything. You just need to calm down, relax, and sign that paper. And the way he said it, it seemed like I was in a bad situation that if I didn't do it, something else was going to happen. There's nobody else here, just me, the prosecutor, and these other two gentlemen. There's no witnesses, there's nothing. I feared for my life. So I signed it, and that was it. And I went back to camp. Once go by, and everything seemed to go back to normal. During the murder investigation, everyone who worked at Karasoki had been interrogated, but then they were released with the exception of Raul Khanna. He used to be one of the best tracker of Dan Fossey. He had quit Karasoki several times. Diane's relationship with her employees was often very volatile. She would mistreat people who displeased her. She'd tell someone summarily, you're fired, get out of camp. Then whatever it was usually would blow over and she'd forget about it. And the next time they were due to come up for their shift, they were allowed to come back to work. She was the kind of boss that everyone hopes they don't get. <laughs> Relicana was more prideful than others and sometimes would um, counter Diane with what she said. And he would say, okay, I'm not taking this, I, you know, I'm leaving. And then he'd get rehired because he was great. The day Diane died, he was not there. baraje baramushikira batwara n'imyenda yakoranaga no murutoki namazizi byose baravuga ngo namaraso kandi aramazizi gibitoki he left and it was his decision and that got distorted into no he wanted to go on working there she didn't want him she fired him that made him angry ubwo niho bamujanye rero kuvuga ngo nitwongiye kumubona our understanding was at that time in the country, the way illegal acts were investigated was through interrogation, not through physical evidence. The Rwandans were out of their investigative depth. It was escalating in anxiety as an irritant between us. The camp staff said two sets of footprints came up to the cabin. Those were two men who were in camp that night who were not supposed to be there. 
byari birenge by'abantu babiri hari inzira yavaga mu giturage biza kunyura kwa kwa wini kunzi yo kwa wini birazamuka kwatekeje kwa rabageze bako ashobora kuba rabageze bana bicanga bahigi ba mwishi baje kumwica We began to get word in the embassy that um, that the investigation was coming to a conclusion. Good news, we found the culprit, we found the guilty party in the case of the Diane Fossey murder, and it is Wayne McGuire. The embassy just said they're charging me with the murder of Diane Fossey. And I have to admit, at that point, I kind of went blank. The authorities said Wayne and Royal Akana had conspired together to cook up a murder plot. Uh, it doesn't make sense. Wayne couldn't speak French, Kin Rwanda, or Kiswahili. Royal Akana couldn't speak English. The gentleman that was arrested, I never met him in my entire life. So I have no clue who he is. The best thing we could do for his safety and security was to get him out of the country. All of a sudden, the adrenaline started pumping, and my only concern was, how am I going to get out of this situation? I remember getting on the plane and was terrified. And I, and I was in first class. That's all my mother could get for me. And I was in there with uh, the World Bank people, and they had a champagne bottle about four feet high and popping it and drinking champagne. And I'm sitting there terrified, like, am I going to get out of here? Any time someone could just pull over and arrest me. I think he was very lucky. The hunt is on this morning for an American wildlife researcher, Wayne McGuire, as the prime suspect in the murder of naturalist Diane Fawcett. McGuire left the country last month, his whereabouts unknown. Rwandan police have asked international authorities for help in locating Maguire. I want to respond to the outrageous charge of the Rwandan government that I murdered Dr. Diane Fossey. I had absolutely nothing to do with Diane's tragic death. She was my friend and one of my mentors. I had everything to lose and nothing to gain by her death. I am shocked and outraged at these false allegations. The Justice Department is free to question me at any time. The Rwandans had solved their problem. They had identified who had killed the prominent American, and the American Embassy had spirited that person out of the country and so therefore the Rwandans had done their job. Wayne McGuire didn't strike me as someone who was hiding a guilty secret. There certainly seemed nothing unusual about Wayne. When I think about Wayne, knowing him, Wayne killing someone, hmm. The question is, why would Wayne kill the animals? I want to make this clear, I did not kill Diane. We heard that Relicana had died in prison. And the official story was that he had hung himself in his cell. They said 
that shows that he was guilty. He was a very nice man. He was a great friend, he was a family man, just a man of real integrity. It was convenient to go after him and, and kill him. And it was terrible. McGuire was tried in his absence and convicted with a Rwandan co-worker who allegedly committed suicide in his prison cell before the trial. I did attend the trial. Any reasonable person would have found that there was no compelling evidence whatsoever. It was farcical. At the trial, no defense lawyer appeared for McGuire. No witnesses were called. No physical evidence was presented. The trial lasted 30 minutes. A judgment was rendered of guilty as charged, and a sentence of death was handed down for Wayne McGuire. I thought it was ridiculous, and it was wrong. They had no real evidence of his guilt, none whatsoever. As a Rwandan, it makes me uh, feel bad. Today, if I saw a judgment like this, I'd be shocked. I would say the judge is incompetent beyond belief. Those who charged him suggested that he wanted to steal her research. That's the word that popped up over and over again, precious documents, precious documents. You had to be as out of touch as that government of Rwanda to think that you could kill the most famous person in a field, take their information, and publish it and become famous yourself. They made the accusation that it was my hair. The prosecutor explained to CNN strands of hair found in Miss Fozzie's hand were sent to a lab in Paris for analysis. The lab confirmed the hairs were those of a white person other than Miss Fozzie. McGuire was the only other white person in the area on the night of the murder. From reading the forensic report established in Paris, it is obvious that they did not take any sample from Wayne to compare it with the samples they found in the hands of the victim. So how can this be incontestable? I don't know. If the report says she had her own hair in one hand and somebody else's hair in the other hand, why didn't they test Wayne McGuire's hair. It could have been her hair because it was dark hair. She could have just reached up when she got hit and grabbed her own hair, which would be a logical reaction. I got back a very uh, non-answer from the FBI. It was inconclusive as to whether or not the hair in her hands was the hair on her head it wouldn't be conclusive proof either way. We know that the crime scene was contaminated by lots of people moving about. The Americans said to the Rwandans, you've got to find out who did this. And so the Rwandans did. 
the Rwandan authorities either were truly incompetent or they didn't want to solve the crime. If you have a good idea, we wouldn't have a good idea. We wouldn't have a good idea. We wouldn't have a good idea. Wayne McGuire and Royal Akana, in my view, were not the guilty culprits. I don't think you can draw any conclusions from the fact that the footprints went by Wayne's cabin. The path that's most likely to get you to Diane's cabin without being heard is the one that goes by Wayne's cabin. Diane's murder is still unsolved. I didn't believe the official story. It just seemed the Rwandan government was happy to have Wayne out of the country and Relicana dead, and the case could be closed. She had almost continuous difficulties with one or another element of the Rwandan government. She was becoming an obstacle. A thorn in their sides. She knew she had enemies. If the government wanted Diane Fossey out of Rwanda, they had the power to just get her out. I keep going back to the gold smuggling. I think someone in a high position suspected or knew that she had something on him and had her killed. They certainly could have found somebody around who would do it. Diane's letter suggests that she had uncovered an illegal gold smuggling ring and that someone in a position of authority was implicated in that. I think it's possible that an official could have had her killed because she knew things. Diane had signed a contract for a, a movie of her life. The film deal that she was negotiating um, for the book, Gorillas in the Mist. She talked about having evidence that she was going to disclose to the world. People involved in illegal activities might be afraid of a global spotlight being put on them by a Hollywood movie. There were perhaps some very powerful forces at play trying to silence Diane Fossey. Many people were massacred during the genocide. Other just fled the country. The entire court the Rohingya court was burnt down. Chances of getting any documentation, anything related to the trial would, is, is almost impossible. Whoever is responsible is either walking free or has, has perished in the wider bloodshed that Rwanda experienced in the 90s. I don't think we'll ever know. But I don't think that Diane would have objected to that as an ending for the script. Because she died a warrior. She would have written that. It's a tragedy on all sides. Diane lost her life, Rella kind of lost his, and Wayne's life was hugely changed. Wayne had to change his career. Losing my academic career, what I dreamed of since I was five years old was more severe than being accused of murder, believe it or not. Obviously, the Rwanda of today is a different place. And there would be an expectation of a much more, I think, um, 
fair and modern judicial process. The damage is done, you know. To clear my name would be nice, but to live for that one simple moment, no, that's not worth that. <laughs> that's not what I'm looking for. I'm in a different field now. I work in the field of mental health, helping people to recover. I'm able to help other people because I've experienced trauma. Dan's story was a story of courage. The gorillas are thriving. The numbers have uh, doubled since the time of Dan Fossey. If Diane hadn't come to Rwanda to habituate gorillas to start their behavior, they would not be here today. If anybody could say that they'd saved a species, I would think that Diane could. Uh, she undoubtedly uh, turned the world's attention towards gorillas. She somehow got behind the big bluff bravado and found the real gorilla. It's that amazing meeting of a, another mind that happens to be in a non-human body that is the magic, and that's what Diane opened up to the world. <laughs> you had to learn how to make gorilla sounds. <laughs> they like that, huh? The work that she started, the innovations that she, she brought, um, you know, habituating gorillas, getting to know them uh, individually and starting what she called active conservation is still what we do today. The first gorilla she contacted in 67, the descendants of those animals are still being followed and monitored and observed today. Gorilla tourism went from being a potential threat to the gorillas to being an important part of the saving of the gorillas. Before she died, Diane, somewhat reluctantly, admitted publicly that the way it was being managed, gorilla tourism was changing things for good. It has taken a huge effort from everyone, from the government, from the partners, working together to ensure that these animals are safe. Gorillas in the Mist, the feature film based on the life of Diane Fossey, stars Sigourney Weaver as the legendary wildlife researcher. After I played Diane and spent so much time with the mountain gorillas in Rwanda, it was impossible for me to go back to the way I saw the world before. It was such a gift to me, actually to be inside Diane's head. I think it was very frustrating to her that in the hierarchy of beings on the planet, animals were below humans, since I think in many ways she thought they were superior. She felt for a while like the only person who was concerned about saving them, and that was probably true to a certain extent. She knew the movie would help, and I think she would be so delighted and, let's not say hopeful, but optimistic about the gorilla's welfare at this point. And even though 880 still means that the gorillas are critically endangered, it's a lot better than 280, which it was when she died. 
It's such a shame that Diana hasn't lived to see mountain gorillas approaching a thousand. Um, that is a, a conservation success story, which uh, she would have really enjoyed. <laughs> I looked up into Digit's warm, gentle brown eyes. He stood pensively, gazing down at me before patting my head and plopping down by my side. I lay my head on Digit's lap, a position that provided welcome warmth. When you realize the value of all life, you dwell less on what is past and concentrate more on the preservation of the future. They're healthy and thriving, and that is Diane's legacy. Diane, if she were to come back from the grave, she would just be so happy. She did not die in vain. Her work is continuing, and it's gonna continue.